it is a good thing to be in the house of God. Amen? I say the house of God because the Bible says where two or three are gathered, God is in the midst to bless. So that means we are in the house of God. Amen? And I'm so excited this morning to talk to us on the topic, praying against your reality in the midst of chaos. Let's do that again. Anybody could say that with me? Praying against your reality in the midst of chaos. Father, we are thankful that you've woken us up this morning. We are grateful that we can come together to be empowered as we go through life, the chaos and everything that comes with it. Bless us, dear God, be in the midst. Speak to us, each of us, where we are today. And we pray, dear Father, that we will not be the same after we leave here this morning and after we leave this weekend because you would have spoken to each of our situations and you would bring us deliverance, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I have a question. Have you ever wondered what is reality? Like, what is reality? Or what determines what reality is? Is it actually the circumstances that you are experiencing, the emotions that you are processing, or the thing that you are seeing with your naked eyes? And I know it might sound a little philosophical sometimes when somebody asks you, like, what is real? Because it seems like we're going deep into philosophy. But is it possible for us to pray against what we are experiencing, processing, or seeing, and sometimes totally miss what we need to be praying about because what we may be experiencing in our reality is not real. Many times when we pray, we, we trust what we are experiencing. We pray about what we are going through, true or false? We pray about what we're going through, right? So we pray about what we are going through. We trust what we see with our eyes, regardless of how bad it is, because that is what is happening to me. So that's what I'm praying about, right? We trust what we hear with our ears, even though it may disturb us. It may disturb our peace. It may hurt us. It may weigh us down because I heard it said for myself. That is what was said to me or that is what was said about me. We trust what we feel physically, emotionally, and psychologically. And the truth is we're not wrong because that is what you are experiencing. You are the one feeling the pain. You are probably getting physically sick from dealing with an emotional situation. And so that's what you pray about. And so we trust our reality because as children, we were taught that we experience the world through five senses, right? We experience the world through seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, touching. And so when we pray, we pray about things that feel tangible to us. Because our five senses, they are working together. We have our children here. I'm sure we, we still teach about the five senses, right? And so when we are praying, we're praying about these things because they feel tangible to us. Because they provide a kind of understanding for us to understand the world, how we are interacting with the world, even though it's sometimes chaotic situations, because these chaotic situations sometimes traumatize us. And that's why we're praying about these things. So when I was a teenager, we used to sing this song. It was made um, popular, actually, this group Anointed sang that song. And it said, life is a dream and heaven is reality. And I'm caught in between. And though it seems this world has everything, it's nothing more than a dream. Because life is a dream and heaven is reality. And if we just hold on, then we will wake up to the face of God. Life is a dream. What we're experiencing, it, the song says, life is a dream and heaven is reality. I'm caught in between what feels real and what actually might be real. And so what really is real? What we are experiencing in what appears to be our physical reality or what we're not seeing. 
which is really God, heaven, and so on. And so that's why I want to talk to us about praying against our reality, because I believe that reality might be one of the most deceptive things that we experience. It is what we experience, but it might be the most deceptive of all things, because can you imagine what you see is not real and what you cannot see is real? Does that even make sense? In Ephesians 6, 12, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What we are wrestling about is not the thing that you can see. So we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but instead we are fighting against unseen things. We are fighting against things that we cannot see. And, and Ephesians 6 12 goes on to explain these unseen things principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what you're fighting. And so, if we're thinking about our prayer lives, most times what we pray about are not really the things, actually, when we pray, what we're praying about are usually focused on what we see, but what we're fighting are things that we cannot see. That's why I said reality might be most deceptive because what appears to be is not, and what is unseen actually is. And so, if I back up a little bit, when I do programs on prayer, I do days of prayer, weeks of prayer, week, weekends of prayer, and so on, I usually take the church on a journey like, to know really how to experience a real prayer life, how to have that real relationship with God. And part of that journey is about dying to self, which is about me giving up what I desire, what I want, etc., to grab hold of God's will for my life, what God wants, instead of what I want, God's desire and God's will for me versus what I want for myself. And so we start with these fundamentals, understanding that prayer is a conversation with God. Prayer is communication with God. It's a two-way conversation. We also understand that when we want our prayer lives to change, Galatians 2.20 becomes a reality for us that I need to die in order for Christ to live in me. So I need to be crucified so that the Spirit of God can now live in me so that when I am praying, my prayers are no longer guided by Nadine, but they're guided by the Spirit of God that is living in me, prompting me how I should pray. And that's why in 1 John 5, 14 to 15, the Bible says, if we ask anything according to the will of God, if we ask anything according to his will, that's God's will, we know that he hears us. So we have a beautiful assurance that if I am dead, if I have been crucified with Christ, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So just imagine if I am dead. So this is me dead. This is not Wakanda. This is just me dead. So if I am crucified and I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me, when I am praying, who's praying? It's Christ in me. So now we can understand in 1 John 5, 14 to 15, when the Bible says, if we ask anything according to his will, we have the assurance that God is going to hear us. And if I know that he hears me, then I know that I have the petition that I, have this, that I requested or I desired of him. And the only way we can pray in the will of God, and this is not even about our, our presentation today, but I want to just set that foundation, is that when the Spirit now lives in us, when we are praying, we are naturally praying the will of God because it is no longer I but Christ in me. And so when I am praying in the will of God, I have the assurance that God hears me and that he is going to give me what I ask, not because it's coming from the dean, but it's coming from the spirit that's living in me that's telling me what to pray about. And so when we pray that will, because God will reveal that will, then sometimes we have a challenge. Because if I am crucified, if I am dying daily, if I am giving up my desires and my wants and my natural inclinations as a human being, and I am now saying, Lord, I don't want to live. I want you to now live in me. I want your will over mine. But now you're praying that will, and then your reality does not match up 
to the promise. What do you do when your reality does not match up to the promises of God? That's the promises that are in the word of God. The promises that you are praying. I am on this journey. I love you and I want your will to be mine. And now that I am praying your will, my reality is directly opposite to what you're promising. What do you do when your reality does not match up? To the will of God. When you take the Bible at its word and you believe in the text that says, train up your child in the way that he should grow so that when he is old, he's not, he will not depart from it. So you've done your part as a parent. You invested the time. You worship with your kids every morning. You prayed over them at night. You anointed them. You anointed their rooms. But as they became older, they began to make their own decisions that were totally contrary to what you taught them. What do you do? When you take care of your body temple, you eat right. You, 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 the, the, the laws of health, you incorporate them, you sleep early, you wake up early, you exercise, you do all what you were taught to do health-wise, and then you hit with a form of cancer. It's almost like you don't get the blessing of the promise that none of these diseases will fall upon you. What do you do? When you follow the guidelines of the Bible and you refrain from sex before marriage, you do it. You said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to save this special gift for my husband or for my wife. And you get married and your reality just doesn't match up because you're thinking I'm going to be rewarded for doing the right thing. I'm going to get the bliss and blessings of marriage because I followed what God asked me to do. I did what I was taught to do. You think that maybe you'll be appreciated and you expect something because you are obedient. You get married and then you have the great disappointment. All that you thought or expected, it's not real. It doesn't happen. So what do you do when you're a good steward? You return your tithe. You give a faithful offering. You support the missions of the church and of the ministries that are doing the work. You are doing all of that. You gave clothes to the poor. You visited the hospitals and prisons. You did all of that, but you do not seem to be getting the blessing of that increase that is promised in Malachi chapter 3. I think of Joseph, the son of Jacob, in Genesis 37. God gave Joseph dreams. He said, Joseph, this is what your future is going to be. This is the plans that I have for your life. So God essentially, through Joseph's dreams, made a promise to him that this is your end. Because Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he says, I have a great expected end for you. And so now... Joseph must have been happy that God had such great plans destined for him. I mean, I would be. And I'm sure for all of us, we should be excited because God said, I have great plans for you. My plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. So the truth is when harm comes our way, we know that it has nothing to do with God. Because his word said, my plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. So harm does not come from me. Because I want to prosper you. I want to give you a great expected end. Another text in the Bible says, The blessings of the Lord maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow to it. So when sorrow comes, it is not of God. Because he says, The blessings that I want to give you, they are going to make you rich. They are going to prosper you. There is no sorrow added to it. So God is not in the sorrows and chaos that are added to our lives. And so Joseph, we know his story, must have been praying that one day he would experience that promise made to him by God, just like you probably praying over the promises that God made to you. Because there are over 3,000 of them in the Bible, and every single one of them applies to you. Many times when we read the Bible, we're speaking about the people in the Bible. But we need to take that word, take those promises and claim them, apply them to our lives because it is no longer Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, it is you that God is speaking to. And so instead we know that instead of Joseph experiencing that reality immediately, he went through a series of chaotic events. His brothers concocted a plan that they thought would put Joseph the dreamer to sleep. 
a slip of disappointment. Do you know the number of people who are looking at us, especially when you are claiming the word of God, when you really have made a commitment in your heart to follow God, there are people who are just assigned by that enemy, not by God, because remember Ephesians 6, 12 says we're not fighting against what we can see. So people are not truly our enemy because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Uh, but there are assignments on our life to cause us to lose sight of the dreams and the desires and the plans that God has for our life because the enemy thinks that if he interferes with us, if I interfere with your health, if I interfere with your marriage, if I interfere with your children, if I interfere with your finances, if I interfere with the things that are near and dear to your heart, I'm going to interfere with how you believe God. Because he's not concerned about these things. These things mean nothing to him. But if I could interfere with these things and your reality is not matching up to the word of God, to the promises of God, then you're going to start to wonder, is God really real? Is the word of God really true? Because I'm claiming it. So his assignment through agents is to really interfere with how we continue to believe that what God said is true and that the word of God is actually real and what I'm experiencing in my circumstances are actually a dream. Is it crazy if we begin to think about the stuff that we go through? Is it really a dream? Am I dreaming? Because it appears as if we are in a reality. But if I'm dreaming, then this is not actually real. So what do I do in these circumstances? So they thought they were going to kill the dreamer and the chaos began and they sold him into slavery. He was sold twice. He was accused of sexual harassment. He was thrown into prison and as an innocent man, he was forgotten there a lot of times in our journey with God. We think that because we are in the will of God, because we are where God wants us to be, that everything will be a-okay. But I want to tell us that's not the case. Because right in the assignment of the blessing will come the burdens, will come what appears to be the curses, because sometimes blessings and curses are, are aligned. They are there. You have this blessing, but sometimes there's a curse attached to it. There is something that weighs you down. You're very disciplined. You are diligent and so on, but sometimes we have this curse of overworking. We're just probably doing too much. We don't know when to pause. We don't know when to stop. And so now Joseph, the brothers think, if we get rid of the dreamer, the dream will die. But the truth is the promise that God has had for his life was not dead, even though his circumstances, even though his reality was so chaotic and looked nothing like the promises of God. Think about your own life. You've been faithful. You love the Lord. You're diligent in the way that you conduct your relationship with him. It's not about church. It's really about you and God at the end of the day. And it's always going to be about you and God. Doctrines, traditions, and all of these things are not going to save us. It's going to be about us and God. It's going to boil down to that relationship. You're not going to hear God through a doctrine but you will hear god through a relationship for a conversation through his word and so god's promise may have appeared to be delayed or denied because joseph's reality did not match up to the vision how could you tell me my brothers will bow to me but now i'm in a pit think about it if somebody's bowing to you you're going to be on top and they will have to be going down. Joseph was in, in a pit. He was below. He was in prison, most likely in some underground something. And so the, 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 the truth is, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good. All things. It's not God's desire. Based on his word in Jeremiah 29, 11, and based on his other promises, it is not his desire for us to experience chaos. That was not his plan when he created us. That was the plan of the enemy. Because he tells us, I didn't create you to harm you. I want to prosper you. I want you to have a great expected end. However, because of sin, because of what appears to be real to us, our reality, God loves us so much. He says all things will work together for good. 
So it's not going to be easy for us to say, Lord, thank you for this bad situation. However, because I love you so much, I am going to take what was meant to destroy you. I am going to take the chaos that the enemy placed in your life. So he thinks he could destroy you, he could destroy your vision, he could destroy your dream, he could destroy the purpose that I have for you. I am going to take all that chaos and I am going to make it work together for you. So what was meant to destroy you, God will now use to instruct you. He will now use it to empower you so that you can be a blessing to other people. So sometimes when what happens in our reality does not match up to the promises, it causes us internal chaos. That's the worst kind of chaos. You see, it's sometimes easy when things are happening outside of you. When things are happening in your so-called physical reality, we look at the wars in the world, we look at the state of relationships in our homes, in our churches, in our marriages, in our friendships, we look at what is happening to us financially, health-wise, we look at all of these things and sometimes we pinpoint, it's easy to pinpoint the things that are happening around you because you could just turn on Fox News or CNN. But what is happening inside you? The things that nobody can see, the questions that are in your head, the doubts that you are having about this God because my reality is not matching up to your word. So now I'm beginning to doubt, are you really real? Is your word real? Is what you're saying true? That internal chaos is really the problem that we have. Last night, Pastor Ava mentioned about the mind. This is really what the enemy is after because if I can interfere with you enough, then I begin to interfere with your mind because that's where the battleground actually is. That's where the real, the real war takes place. That's where the real chaos happens. Because if in our minds we can resolve that come what may, I shall not be moved when our physical realities appear to be totally opposite to what the word of God says, we have already made a decision in our minds that this is not real. This is a dream. This is not the real thing. The real thing will come one of these days. And so God's promises to Joseph was not denied. It's just that Joseph's reality had not yet touched or interacted with the promise of God. In our own experiences, sometimes, you know, Lord, you said this, I am believing you for it. And we're praying about these things for days, weeks, months, sometimes years and even decades, and it has not happened. We remember the story of Abraham. He was waiting and praying for the son that God had promised, but it was not time yet because God's promise to him that you will have a son through which the world will be multiplied. And my reality is not, is, is not, is not matching that promise. And that's why the wife told him, you know, let's help God out. Because sometimes when our reality is not matching the promise, we begin to try to think for God. Let me just help you out a little bit. Because you said this, so let's, let, let me help you figure it out. Let's accelerate this promise. Let me come up with a plan that seems to go in line with what you're telling me to do. And so the truth is, it's not that God's word will not come to pass. It is just not a matter of God's timing yet. But it's not easy in the waiting. Let's not get fooled waiting on the promise. Can you imagine the amount of doubt that Abraham must have had all of these years waiting to see that come to pass? And even when he had that son Ishmael, God said, let me tell you, I told you that I was going to bless you through a son. I was going to do this for your generations. I will tell you how much your plan did not help me. Let me give you the name of the son you're supposed to have. His name is Isaac. So sometimes when we're waiting, it is difficult because everything seems more chaotic because in our minds, that's why God does not tell us everything. Because can you imagine God revealing everything to us? When, when things are going wrong, we'll be like, okay, this doesn't make sense because you said that, okay? And, and you see this route that you want to take me on, Lord, I don't like it. Let me just try to do this instead. It's going to take me to the same place. We almost want to act like we're GPS for, for God. So I'll give you an alternate route that makes me more comfortable, okay? And so sometimes when our reality is not matching up, it's easy for us to begin to doubt because I am awaiting God and you said it. So how come your word is not coming to pass? You could imagine Joseph. 
being in that pit, being sold into slavery, and in your mind you have this, this internal chaos because to me God told me my brothers would bow to me. I thought I was going to be above and not beneath. So how come I'm in a pit? How come I'm in a prison? How come I'm being accused of something I never even did? And so sometimes in the waiting process, we go through more internal chaos than anything else. So what do you do when your reality does not match up to the promise you hold on? It's easier said than done. But you hold on. What other choice do we have? You hold on. I remember Job. I think of him in the most horrendous ordeal of his life. The Bible told us that Job lost everything. Any of us in this room have lost everything already? Any of us lost everything? He lost all of his animals, his servants, his children. He lost everything that was important to him, everything that he owned. And the Bible tells us in Job 1 verse 20, when Job heard this, the Bible says he tore his clothes. He shaved his head because he was in great distress. He was in great sorrow because he was a real man. He had emotions just like us. The Bible says though, that after Job tore his clothes, after he shaved his head, Job did something that blows my mind every single time I read it. The Bible says that Job knelt down and worshiped God. How could you kneel down and worship God after you lost everything. You're in great distress. You're in great sorrow. But the Bible says he knelt down and worshipped. So it would appear as if maybe Job was operating in shock. We could say that. Maybe he was in shock. He probably didn't realize what was said to him. But in verse 21, Job is saying to God, we bring nothing at birth. We take nothing at death. The Lord gives, the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Job worshiping God after he lost everything. After Job's reality is not matching up to God's promises, Job is worshiping God. And it may seem as if he was in shock. But the truth is nine chapters later, in Job chapter 10 verse 12, Job is still praising God. So this was not an initial shock reaction. Job is telling God, he said, God, you have granted me life and favor. You have granted me life and favor. Job says, your care has preserved my spirit. I say, your care? When I'm thinking about care, I'm thinking about protection. I'm thinking of parents trying to prevent kids from knocking their heads on the edges of, of, of different pieces of furniture. I'm so happy I'm not a parent because I could almost imagine me being scared that my child hits their head on the edge of this. I'm thinking of how I would have to proof everything in the house. Job is telling God after he lost everything, nine chapters later, you have granted me life and favor. Your care has preserved my spirit. Job, even though his reality was not matching up to the word of God, even though his reality was not matching up to the promises of God, Job found himself praising God in the midst of the worst thing that could happen to anybody and still find himself praising God because Job understood that this is not of God. God did not want to hurt me. This has to be of the enemy. The thing about Job's story that is amazing is that Job was praising God not knowing what the end would have been. You see, when we read Job's story, it's easy for us to say God blessed Job double for his trouble. But when Job was in his reality, Job was praising God, not knowing that he would have been blessed double. All he was doing was trusting God. All he was doing was believing that if God permitted this to happen, God did not prescribe it. But if he permitted it, it's going to work together for my God. Even Joseph, in the midst of his madness and what appeared to be disappointed promises, because there you have the dream before you, God's vision board for your life, you are going to be great. Your brothers will bow to you. Your father and mother will bow to you. You remember when Joseph even told his father that I dreamt this, his father said, even though his father loved him so much, his father said, you mean to tell me that... 
me and your mother, we're going to be bowing to you. And so Joseph, in the midst of all of that, what appeared to be rejection, accusation, lack, oppression, and so on, still continued to trust God. That is why having a relationship with God is, is, is really the critical aspect of everything. Being in that relationship, because if you're not in a relationship with God, you're not going to trust his methods. Immediately you will throw him out. Because I, I believe you. And if I believe God, and if I'm in that relationship with you, then I'm trusting that you are looking out for me. Job said, your care has preserved my spirit. So if we're in that relationship, then it's easier for us to trust God in the midst of our chaos because we know that, number one, I may not be in this chaos by myself. Because remember Job, in Job's story, God and the enemy had some interaction. God said, have you, have you considered my servant Job? God was literally boasting about Job. God might be boasting about us right now in our chaos, but it's not easy, y'all. A few years ago, it would have been easier for me to say, yeah, God is trusting me. Because I remember when there were times when I was in really chaotic situations and I thought, you know what? God is trusting me. God maybe had a conversation with the enemy over my life. But sometimes when your reality becomes so chaotic, especially internally, it's really difficult to trust the methods. It's like, God, how could you? I know. And I was speaking to Pastor last night, Pastor Alvin last night. And I tell God, I said, Lord, this chaos in my life, my dad, my sinful earthly father wouldn't even want that for his child. So how could you tell me in Matthew 7, 7, if earthly parents are willing to give good gifts to the children, how much more are you willing to give good gifts to those who ask? I say, but my daddy wouldn't want this for me. So how could you sit by and watch? Chaos causes us conflict. Sometimes in our relationship with God, chaos causes us conflict in the most important relationship because our reality is not matching up to the promise. Our reality is not matching up to the word of God. The enemy's plan for all of us is to destroy us. Just like Joseph, Joseph's brothers had plans to destroy him. The enemy's plan is to to shake us enough, to shake our world enough, to bring so much chaos to us internally, to bring it in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, in our churches, bring so much chaos, shake us up so much that everything that we believe about God is coming out. It's almost like you have this box and you're shaking stuff and they're just dropping out. He wants to shake our world so violently that now we begin to question everything because my reality is not matching up to the word of God. Therefore, something is wrong with the word of God. That means something may be even wrong with God or God may not even exist because this does not match up with his word. The enemy's plan is for us to trust what we are experiencing, to trust what appears to be real, to trust what appears to be our reality when the Bible tells us what you are experiencing is not the real thing. That's not what you're fighting. Anything that you can tangibly put your, your hands on, it's not your problem. It's not the real thing. His plan is to make us think that God is a liar. But we know that God is not man, that he should lie. In fact, Joseph, in Genesis 50, 20, said to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God allowed this to happen for good so that many lives could be saved. As hard as it is for us to experience the realities that we are going through right now, the chaos in what appears to be our realities and continue to trust God. If we think about the end and think about this Jeremiah 29, 11 promise, that word that you have good plans for me, you're going to give me a great expected end. If we can grasp hold of these promises as reality, then it may assist us sometimes in going through the struggles of life. So what do you do when your reality does not match up to the promise? You continue to believe God and that what you are going through is not out of God's control. I am not going to pretend by any means that this is easy. 
because it's not. The thing that we can hold on to is the fact that God, you did this for me in the past. Whatever that this is, whatever experience that you have with God, hold it as a frame of reference. Hold on to it and say, God, if you did it back then, then you can do it again. So I am going to hold on to you because of our history. I am going to trust and believe you because you've done this for me in the past. Because you've done that for me in the past. Not because of what you did for others in the Bible. Note, you hold on to your own promise. You hold on to your own experiences. You can claim these from the word, but we want to be having, we want to have experiences with God that we can trust him based on our own history with him. Because sometimes people will come to you and tell you you're a fool. How could you believe the word in a book that is so old? But if you have your own promises with God, when your family and your friends and others come to you and say, what stupidness or foolishness are you doing? You can say, God did it for me back then, and I know that he can do it again. That's why relationship with God is so important. Praying against your reality means that you're praying in faith. You are holding on to something that is not yet, but that's possible. I know your word says this, it is not in my reality right now, but I'm going to hold on to your word because God's word is fact. His word is the only true reality. His promises is what's actually real. So I am going to hold on to this that feels or seems intangible to me right now because I am believing that you are able to do what your word says. The Bible says God's word will not return void. It will accomplish what he has set it out to accomplish. Lord, I'm going to continue to believe you even when my reality does not match up. Praying against your reality is not a walk in the park. Because how could I ignore what I am seeing, tasting, touching, feeling, and hearing for something that I have not yet seen, touched, tasted, smelled, or heard. It's so easy because we've been socialized and indoctrinated to believe and interact with these five senses. David, in fact, let me just share with us that the most sometimes painful experiences as a Christian, when we think of chaos, is when we go through our internal experiences based on maybe external circumstances. I think about David in Psalm 22. He openly said to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So in case you're sitting there thinking, maybe I lack faith. We have faithful men in the Bible, great men of God, questioning God, based on what they were experiencing in their reality, David said to God, why have you forsaken me? The prophet Jeremiah felt abandoned by God because he faced rejection and persecution because he was delivering God's message. And he said, in Jeremiah 20 verse 7, he said, oh Lord, you have deceived me. I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. He said, I have become a laughing stock. People were laughing at him. He goes on to tell God in verse 14 of chapter 20, curse the day I was born. This is how distressed Jeremiah had gotten. Sometimes when we're going through things, it almost feels like, why, why was I even born? And so Jeremiah is telling God, curse the day I was born, the day that my mother bore me. It was not a blessed day. Curse the man who went to my father and tell my father you are expecting a son. He even goes on in verse 18 to tell God, why did I even come out of the womb? So I can experience such toil and sorrow and I'm spending my days in shame. These are faithful men of God. Elijah in, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah asked God to take his life. He was that distressed. And I can guarantee you sometimes when we read these stories, we sometimes think these men, something was wrong. But I remember, I believe it was April 2013, 
I'd, I, would finish, I was finishing up my doctoral work, and I was having a conversation with God about purpose, because that's really important to me. And I told him, if you have no purpose, you take my life. I don't want to live just doing any nine to five. If you have no purpose for me, take me out. Those are my words to him. At the time, I had not yet even known about Elijah. I read the stories, but I never took note of it. But I remember one day speaking to one of my mentors, and I told him what I told God, and he said, Nadine, you're in good company. He said, the greatest men in the Bible are well, where you are right now. In the New Testament, Jesus, while on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So sometimes our reality shakes us. It causes us to feel distressed, depressed, alone, abandoned, rejected, because what we are experiencing does not feel good. So how do we continue to pray against what appears to be our reality and stay in a relationship with God. The thing is, we cannot trust what we see and feel. We cannot trust what we experience with our senses. As I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to me because the truth is, it, it, how do you ignore what you're going through? This seems to be the real thing. How? I remember going through a struggle with God. I think it was 2018. I told God, if you're not going to attend on to this, you're not taking me on. Literally, for the first time in my life, I was trying to be rebellious. I sat in a prayer garden in the Philippines, and I was saying to him, if you're not going to look out for me, I'll look out for myself. I know I cannot outmatch God. But that's how much I was looking for attention from him, because I'm like, this reality does not look like you. What are you doing about it, God? And so sometimes, when, we, when we're facing chaotic realities when our realities are not matching up to god the truth is we cannot trust it the bible actually tells us instead you are going to trust the lord proverbs 3 5 to 6 with all your heart do not lean to your own understanding because your own understanding will lead you to trust a reality that is not of me so don't lean into it Trust me instead. This is almost like God is, is there trying to tell us, oh, look, look at me over here. I'm here. Look at me over here. Do not trust what you can see. Ignore this. Ignore this. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Trust me. We follow. Do not lean to what you're seeing. Don't lean into it. Trust me with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me. I am going to make the path straight for you. Don't look over there. Don't look at what appears to be real. Just, just look over here. Look. Look here instead. We, we, another thing that we can do is to hold on to the dream or the promise of God. You see, God has great plans for all of our lives. And the truth is, regardless of our realities, regardless of what we're experiencing, that doesn't match up to the promises, to the word of God, to the leading of God, and so on, regardless of what we're experiencing, if we hold on, grasp hold of that promise, I am not going to let go. This is what you've said. I am sure Joseph doubted at some point in his experience when he was in prison, when he was in the pit. He probably said to himself, this is not going to happen. I am sure Abraham doubted that he was going to have that son that was promised by God because it's 25 years. This cannot be real. This thing will not. Because you're living in the reality. You're growing old. How could I have a child when I'm old? This doesn't make sense. How could God allow me to go through my whole young days, my youth, and promise me a child, and now in my old age, I'm going to have it? You remember his wife, Sarah, saying, this is a joke. I'm an old woman now. And so sometimes the reality, the, the what we're going through does not match up to what God says, does not match up to the promise, but we have the assurance that whatever God says will come to pass. Whatever he says will come to pass. And whatever we are going through, he's going to allow it to work for our good because I am not going to be derailed by what appears to be your reality because my word is the real thing. Think about this, right? The Bible says that God is the word. We say it all the time, God is the word. The word is speaking. So when the word God, when God who is the word says a thing, the thing is done because the Hebrew word for word and the Hebrew word for thing is the same thing. So when God who is the word is speaking, whatever God says is, because God is the word and the word is speaking and his word is the thing. 
That's why in the creation week, when God says, let there be light, light appeared and light continues to appear. It's obedient to the word because God's word was light. Whatever God says is. So whatever God has said over your life, despite what is happening in your reality is because God's word is the thing. It's already done. So instead of trusting our reality, the Bible teaches us to accept God's plan for our lives because that's the real thing. Even when things are difficult or they're not going as planned or they're not the reality, God's word is the thing. And so my encouragement for us, instead of praying against what we can see, our reality, let's pray for God's guidance and strength and peace to navigate the chaos that we experience in our life. Because we can trust that God will never leave us no matter what we face. No matter what chaotic situation you are in right now, know that God is still with you. Amen. Know that God has not forgotten you. You may feel forsaken. You may feel rejected. You may feel abandoned. You may feel depressed and distressed. You may wish the life that you have is gone. But the truth is God's plans God's words, God's reality for your life is not derailed by your apparent reality. This is just a dream. It's nothing more than a dream because God's word is the real thing. That's the reality. And so we want to grasp hold of it and, and do whatever it takes to hold on, even though by a thread. Hold on even though by a thread. That's better than not holding on at all. Claim his words. Your strength is made perfect when I'm weak and say, God, I am weak. I have nothing to hold on right now. Tell him, I don't have that strength. I need you to do it because I don't have it. That's why Philippians 2.13, the Bible says, God is the one working in us to will and to do. Amen. Because we don't have the strength anyhow. So God has to will us. You say, I don't have the strength, but I'm willing. And then the word says, he will do. Because I don't have it. All I can trust is what I'm experiencing. And I am done. I'm finished. I remember me saying to God, two years ago, I said, I am done. I'm not speaking anymore in your name. I'm done. I'm finished. I start canceling appointments. I stopped taking those I, that were coming. I'm like, I am done. I'm not speaking anymore until you fix this piece of chaos in my life. But God, here I am. We cannot fight with him. I was like, I'm done. And let me tell you, God has a sense of humor so much. I'm thinking, let me focus more on the business aspect of my business. And I'm having a meeting with somebody who's not a Christian. And at the end of the assessment that I paid $600 for for one hour, the lady says to me, the twist about your life is your faith. <laughs> I was like, okay, God, this is me trying to deviate. The same thing happened to me earlier this year. Going through the same process again because this chaos is is the reality for me. And I have been praying about it and it's not matching up to your promise. I'm tired. I have another meeting with a lady and the lady's talking to me and what does she tell me about? My prayer life. That's the thing. And I'm like, Lord, you have a sense of humor. You're coming into meetings with business people and reminding me of why I'm here. So I want to say to us, sometimes it's so easy to trust our chaotic realities. It's not your fault. It's what you're experiencing. But he's saying it's not the real thing. It's nothing more than a dream. This is not of me. Because one day you're going to wake up to my reality, which is my word over your life. Amen? Amen. It's what I have promised. It shall come to pass. Amen. My word will not return void. It will accomplish what I said over your life. Amen. And so in the midst of our chaos, how do we pray against our reality? We trust. We do whatever it takes to hold on, hang on, even by a thread that your word we claim those promises that's the reality life is a dream what we're experiencing right now but heaven is reality Amen. the things of God is reality Amen. 
We're caught in between right now. We're in the great controversy. We're caught. We're, we're getting the stings of the war. We're, we're getting the blows of the fight because we're caught in between. And even though this world, what we're experiencing, seems like it's the real thing, it's nothing more than a dream because one day, this will not be our reality anymore. And so if we want to recommit ourselves, okay, God, give me strength. Give me grace. I need, because really we need strength. We need grace. We need a kind of crazy faith that, you know what? This is not real. I know I'm experiencing you, but you're not real. I can see you. I can feel the madness, but this is not real. If we want to recommit to a mindset of, Lord, give me eyes to see things from your perspective today. Allow me to recognize that what appears to be real is not because your word is what's real. If that's your recommitment this morning, I want you to stand because I want us to just say a prayer because the enemy will continue to interfere with our physical reality because he knows that we sometimes trust what we experience. And so, Father, this morning, we... And not just grateful for life, but we're just grateful to be reminded that the chaos, the ill circumstances of our lives, the things that bring us pain and distress, that sometimes causes us to go into depression, that sometimes causes us to doubt your love for us, that sometimes causes us to believe that your word is not true. Father, we ask this morning that you will renew our minds, that it will not be conformed to what we're experiencing, to our realities. It will not be conformed to what we are seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, and touching, but instead we are going to grab hold of another unseen thing, which is what your word says. Even though we have not yet experienced it, we are going to grab hold of what is unseen, because by faith we are believing that it is just not yet, but it's your word so it shall come to pass over each of our lives. That you want to do great things through us. And so Father, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us quick understanding. Give us all that we need to continue to hold on, Lord. Allow us to reflect on your goodness in past times. And the moments where you came through, even when our realities did not match up to the promises, Lord, you came through for us. And as we reflect on those moments where you did those things in our lives, we can continue to trust that all things truly, God, you are going to work it together for our good and your word will come to pass. Father, help us to not trust what we're experiencing in our physical realities because the enemy is interfering with everything that he could in our lives so that we can distrust you. We can distrust your word. So help us, Lord, not to trust these things, but to pray instead for you to allow us to see things the way that you see them and to recognize that anything that harms or hurts us is of the enemy. You want to do great things, things that would not hurt us, you want to do all of these in us and so that we can continue not only to experience you but to draw others as well to you because lord we know that your word is true be with us as we go through the rest of today help us to just spend time get these little moments where we can just connect with you so that you can help to reshape our minds give us refreshed perspectives about the chaos in our lives so that we can know how to pray father may your holy spirit teach us and lead us to know how to navigate, how to pray to navigate the chaotic situations of our lives and in the world we pray. So we thank you God for doing this because you said if we ask it according to your will, we've not asked anything selfish. We've only asked dear God for us to be able to know things from your perspective and so you said if we ask it according to your will, you will hear and you will answer and so we praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.